I was a big fan of the original movie when I was a teenager. And it was the movie your parents didn't want you to see because it was just packed with kind of uh, unmotivated nudities and uh, senseless violence. <laughs> to stay true to, you know, the, the slightly irreverent tone of Death Race 2000 without becoming intentionally campy. Um, I wanted to tell a more serious story and uh, have it be a darker movie uh, with still comedy in it, but not, not kind of uh, campy comedy. You can fucking shoot me, but you just can't, motherfucker. Kill me! <laughs> We've made a film that I think is now believable. You can see reality television as showing an event like this in a few years' time. Welcome to Death Race. The thing about Paul is he wanted to keep this very, very real. Fuck me. Rap? I don't know if they said rap. What do you say? Does that, that look good? Well, we can't go again. <laughs> I think we're done. I, yeah. think, we I think we're again. done for the night. <laughs> take well. take we got to have this car back together by yeah. tomorrow morning because it's got to be a I main wanna, unit. I don't know who the guy was that wired the last one. Yeah. Five more feet. <laughs> what we tried to do very hard in the film, we've tried to ground it in reality as much as possible. Uh, we surrounded Jason with really strong actors. Um, We've made his character very believable. I actually had a meeting with Paul, and it was so detailed, and, you know, he had pictures of the cars, and, you know, the emotion of the death race. Uh, and he just knew every beat of the story. And I was just like, God, this man is, you know, is so tuned in. Jason is, he's very blue collar, which I needed for the role. And he's, uh, he's got a tough, but amoral kind of veneer to him. I think that's that kind of 1970s style vibe that I really, really liked. You know, it was the young Bronson, young Eastwood, young Steve McQueen feel. And, and I think Jason's one of the few actors who has that in spades. I'll do anything. You're gonna die. He's not too Hollywood. He's got all the things that you, you want in a gritty movie, and we, we've tried to make this film gritty. It's time to get ready. We didn't want someone who had that kind of like puffed up LA bodybuilder look. Um, which I, we wanted something that was lean and wiry and tough. Again, you know, t getting back to what, what Charles Bronson looked like, what, what Clint Eastwood used to look like. A lot of the people that are training in the prisons are getting very lean and very strong and very fast and very dangerous. So the kind of training that we, uh, that we took on board was that kind of training. And He got in amazing shape for the movie. Um, he dropped to about 6% body fat. Lots of exercise that involves uh, a lot of body weight and uh, a lot of very sort of physical things like climbing ropes, lots of press-ups and chin-ups and explosive exercises with medicine balls. <laughs> I mean, I've just made a film in the UK, and uh, the traditional English way of eating is not something that uh, you want to get used to if you want to, you know, take your shirt off in a movie. <laughs> I mean, uh, so, I mean, the diet plays a big thing. This is my daily indulgence. Indulgence. Turkey, cauliflower, and raw veggies. It was, uh, you know, putting the right foot forward, and we... You know, we got some great results. I mean, I, you know, I lost pounds and pounds of body fat and, you know, put pounds and pounds of muscle on and, uh, in a very short space of time. Everybody else is eating pie, all things sweet, full of taste. I get relegated to a tray of cold food with zero calories and zero taste. Oh. Jason came up to me at one point towards the end of the shoot and said, Paul, I just can't wait to drink beer and eat cake. But, you know, God bless him, he didn't. You know, during the movie, he was very, very focused. The sacrifice, it's big. I told him, you fucked up. You've never been this in shape in your life in any film you've ever done. And now you've created a new standard. And people are going to expect your body to be that way in every movie now. So 
Um, I said, you might as well go ahead and get used to your little vegetable salads and all of the shit you've been eating to get you in shape like this, because welcome to the club. No, get much Thank you. get much better than this. Uh, he's really gonna shock people with how lean and mean his body is on this film, and he, he inspired me to step my fitness game up. See, this is what happens, baby. We up, we up early, full throttle. He's letting me know what I gotta do to go up in there and do the magic. Gonna it's 11.30. It's up, up early. Ty, for Tyrese, this is up early. This is very Mid -day. early. <laughs> this is very early, okay? I love Tyrese. You know, the guy didn't grow up in Beverly Hills. He's got a tough background. You know, he's, Tyrese is the real deal. You know, he's a tough kid from the streets. And he's got a great look, but he's a, he's a street kid. And that made him believable as a prisoner. He's got the same kind of urban blue collar feel that Jason has. And for me, you know, that was very much the heart of casting this movie, is I wanted believable people in these roles. Because in the movie, it's a hard sport for a hard age. And I needed hard men to play that sport. We're here out in the open, and the director has protection. Look. Look, he's all protected behind the glass. <laughs> right, protected director, okay? The actors die. <laughs> I love this game. Although I've never seen Deadwood myself. When I heard I was working with Amy McShane, when I heard he was just this great actor, I had to do a little research, so I went to YouTube and pulled up a few things on Ian McShane and checked him out. I know Ian McShane from when he was a huge television star in Great Britain. Certainly, as far as my mother was concerned, he came to visit. He was the only star in the movie. Oh, yeah, everybody yeah. thinks that. Thanks what? About escaping. McShane is a particular favorite of mine. I mean, you know, they don't give those uh, Golden Globes out for nothing, and uh, he's such a tremendous sort of father figure to everybody. They call me coach. Everyone does. I've never done an action adventure movie quite like this. This is like NASCAR to the death inside prison. So a lot of fun. Tomorrow morning you'll meet your navigator. Case. Yeah, it's, it's a fun shot, because you have all these men and you know how men can be in prison. You don't have a really a lot of women, you know? How lucky can one man be? You see, when she gets off the bus, uh, the old wolf whistles and um, all the rest of it. <clears throat> I mean, she looks good in a, in, a, in a crop top, to say the least. What happened out there, Case? He got distracted. He got distracted? She's extremely glamorous and beautiful, and at the same time, she's got that, that edginess that would possibly, you know, allow you to believe that she's, uh, you know, done a few sort of mischievous things and ended up in prison. You know, it's my first movie, so there's a lot of things I still don't, you know, get, and you gotta pretend you got, but, you know, there's still some things and, you know, difficulties, and there's a lot of things, too, with the dialogue, you know, and the fact that we're... I'm in a car. Shaking left, right, I'm getting hit by the ran, I'm getting hit by the Buick. And you're like, look back, look left, you know, get the gauges, smoke, oil, palm, you know, so you have so many things going on sometimes. That was ridiculous. <laughs> well, again, you know, we wanted to make the message clear it's an A movie. It is not a traditional B movie, it's not a traditional genre picture, it's different. So we, we felt by populating the film with major actors, proven. Uh, dramatic actors like Joan Allen and Ian McShane, that message will be more clearly conveyed. You know, you're used to seeing Jason in a movie like this from Transporter, from Lockstock. You're not used to seeing Joan Allen in a movie like this. Shut the fucking computers down now! Give me that! Okay, cocksucker. Fuck with me, and we'll see who shits on the sidewalk. Uh I appear to be this big bad wolf, but I'm really a soft cookie. Um, one of my favorite love movies is The Notebook. And uh, Joan Allen was in that movie. <laughs> so ever since I seen her performance in that movie, man, I was just like, man, I get to do a movie with her, three-time Oscar nominee, Joan Allen. 
It's incredible. You know, I think I've played a fair amount of characters which sometimes are characterized like the moral center, the character that's doing the right thing, it's the strong one, blah, blah, blah. And it was really fun to be playing a character who is not doing that. <laughs> she's, she's kind of doing the opposite, but kind of with a very sort of, with a velvet touch. Call it intuition, but uh, I don't think you belong in here with the rest of these animals. And Joan Allen is one of the great villains. And she was very much fashioned on a prison governor that I did a lot of research on, who was the real governor of San Quentin for 10 years. And uh, in running San Quentin, she instituted a lot of pretty revolutionary things. One of the things she would do every day is walk through the prison yard. And she would do so unarmed, without a guard, and she would just walk through the midst of all of these Category 4 prisoners. And that's pretty amazing. That's something we recreate in the movie. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. There goes the baddest ass in the yard. Terminal Island Penitentiary hosts three days of the ultimate in auto carnage. When I first came to this location, Paul was so excited. He said, I found the perfect location. It's enormous, and the cars are really racy. I was like, so excited. It's a perfect location. We looked at Formula One tracks. We looked at NASCAR tracks. The problem with all of them was they kind of they looked like what they were, and uh, they looked a little dull, a little boring, and none of them would allow us to do what we needed to do, which is shoot heavy machine guns, blow things up, have huge craters blown in the road, I mean, for obvious reasons. And then we had a real breakthrough when we got to Montreal. I found this great location, which was called Alstom, which is an abandoned train factory. I said to the scout, just show us something big, bleak and industrial, because Paul and I really like those kinds of landscapes. And they showed us Alstom, where in fact I am currently sitting in one of the warehouses, this massive industrial complex, disused, and Paul got out of the car and he said, stop, I've got it. And he reconceived the entire racetrack as a track that runs in between these disused warehouses there and then. We're on our lot, which is our big old industrial site, which is these rolled rail yards. So these, these walls and these windows are based, basically the exterior walls of uh, some of the places we're going to race by on the outside. Outside there is the exterior of the Bleecker Tunnel, which is part of our racetrack. We're all trying to do everything really close and handy here. The look of the film is deliberately we went with a kind of crumbling rust belt look. And a lot of the locations were built in the 1970s. So the movie has a very uh, interesting kind of period feel to it. So although it's set slightly in the future, you know, the cars and the locations feel like it could almost be set slightly in the past. I mean, it's just, you only have to walk around this place and you just, it, it takes your breath. I mean, the whole vision has come together for Paul, like, in such a way that it, it really is quite spectacular. I mean, it's just so big on its scale. You know, your, your eyes go wide and you're going, wow, this is going to be cool. I mean, a lot of times you have a great location, but people don't realize that cars have to get up to 50, 60 miles an hour. Go, go, go. Well, this movie was different than most. It was kind of like two, two movies in one for, from a design standpoint. You know, we had the sets as one thing, which is the more normal, normal aspect of production design. With this one, we had uh, the whole component of the cars. And they were, it was like designing the characters in the movie as well. They're, they're pretty important. Vroom, vroom. <laughs> We started at the beginning of June. We started, you know, getting, I think we had 30 cars at that time. You know, I had to strip them all the way down to, you know, basically bare metal. And, uh, you know, build them from the ground up, doing roll cages, fuel cells, racing seats. So we tried to get on the whole American cars from different periods. We have the, the Riviera, the Trans Am, the Chrysler, the, the Dodge Ram, the Mustang. We have a Porsche from 1988, but frankly, those cars are not expensive to pick up these days. And we have a BMW. We have a 7 Series BMW, which we've chopped out the passenger side, so it's rather like driving a First World War fighter plane. And as you see the cars being built, you start, like I say, realizing how it's going to be a cool picture. And, I mean, it's amazing. Just someone sitting there and placing a gun on top of the hood, how that just brings another level to, you know, to the cars. I mean, we've, you know, been working for long hours, you know, the last three months, almost seven days a week for the last two months, trying to get them ready. You know, prepping the body work and doing the motors and you know, get them ready for the stunts. We've seen cars with uh, nitrous oxide systems before, you know, without mentioning any names, but, you know, we've seen that, but we have never, ever, in my, you know, in my short years on the planet, 
I've never seen anything quite like what uh, Paul has drummed up for this movie in terms of what the cars have to give. The idea is they've all been made in a prison workshop um, because the prisoners have their own teammates who kind of help them build the cars and then in between the legs of the race repair the cars as well. We have 14 hours, gentlemen, so let's get to work. So there's a very kind of homemade feel to the cars which kind of harks back to the rec tech aesthetic of 80s movies like The Road Warrior. They're tricked out with rockets and guns and bits and bobs and they're all 45 with shields at the back to prevent them because the race is crazy. They are mean, mean machines. They're not fooling around. Look out! <laughs> The mechanics uh, here, I mean, they had a, a huge hint um, from just getting the tractors up and running and trying to get everything to go, you know, before. And then the weaponry guys, of course, have their hands full of getting all these weapons on the things, you know. So we have the 24-hour mechanics that work on them all night long, uh, put new body parts on them, fix the cars. Uh, then we have an on-set crew during the daytime when we're filming that can jump in and, like a pit crew and fix the cars right on set. We're a mobile pit crew. We'll fly right out there on set right with everybody else, you know, while they're setting up camera or doing whatever. And we've got our trailer full of tools and all the parts and good stuff and fly in with our tools and, and fix everything as quick as we can. We'll change a tire or, you know, whatever we need to do. And then uh, when you get the gun guys over to do their thing, put their guns on. But uh, we can handle just about anything out here. These cars, they're banging things, hitting and slamming into walls. And uh, it's its a lot of work to try to keep them running. You now we've wrecked uh, two Mustangs, Porsche, and you know, one of the BMWs, Chryslers. So, you know, they're falling apart. And those guys are, you know, being kept pretty busy at that shop. The estimate for the cost of each car, once I put in man, power, time, materials, is at least $250,000, possibly $300,000. And then blowing it up. Originally, Death Race 2000, they shot it in 15 days. Uh, we took considerably longer than that to shoot this movie. But, you know, we've still delivered the essence of what this film was. My pleasure. I mean, I'm a big fan of action movies. I've never seen anything like this attempted in a movie, and, and we really pulled it off. I mean, I haven't seen anything like it. I don't think people will have seen anything like it. I just want them to have something that is so exciting, but so believable, that they just say, there's nothing else like this. This is totally fresh. Get on my lap. What? Get on my lap. Yeah, you got hot chicks, you know. What more do you need? <laughs> boys being boys. Three, two, one, explosion! special effects fabrication shop where we're putting all the cars together. We've got several different models, as you can see throughout the shop, that we're piecing together. And, you know, we just start out with a strip all the cars down bare bones and start welding parts on. We get the cars in just like, you know, you would buy a car from a used car lot. We strip everything out that we don't need, all the interior, stuff like that. So we put roll cages, racing seats in them, things like that. And then, uh, start piecing them together, putting all the extra added stuff that they want on. I've certainly made lots of movies that have lots of CG images in them. But I think audiences perhaps are getting a little tired of that. Action! The nice thing about this movie, Paul was trying to have as limited visual effects as possible. He wanted to make this as real as possible. He wanted all the gags to be real, the cars he crashing to be real, He's everything to be camera. real. When people were making movies like Bullet, The French Connection, Walter Hill's The Driver, uh, and in particular, um, The Road Warrior. 
car races were done for real. Uh, the car crashes were done for real. If you saw it, it was because some stuntman strapped himself into a car and just went and did it. Uh, there's no computer-generated imagery. Everything we could do in the physical world, uh, he wanted to do. Uh, a lot of big wrecks. Uh, we have some, some effects wire work that, that helped with the stunt work, but uh, we tried to keep it as real as we could and stay away from the visual effects of uh, flipping cars through the air and all this. It's all physically real. We actually do get thrown around, and I'll show you the little bruise. I have a bruise here, it's covered with makeup, but um, I do get battle scars, so you do get thrown around on the car, you know, so it's really easy to like visualize and, and kind of have an effect of what's going on around you and stuff. <laughs> that wasn't part of it, right? All right. I'm a <laughs> you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I mean, there's times when I've actually, uh, thought about wouldn't it be nice to have one of those miniguns sort of set up there on the bonnet you know get yourself in all kinds of trouble if you start using those <laughs> if you see what one of those things do oh my god he's too heavily armored oh yeah he he couldn't wait well you know he's doing this whole movie and he hadn't had a chance to do any any action and um, after being on stage he just couldn't wait it was like a tiger let out of its cage and boy he really he was doing 180s and reverse 180s and forward 180s and banging cars and um, he had a great time this is this is the only way the actors get in you see this this is how the actors get in this is the way the stunt guys have to get in because they didn't give us a door that has hinges on it and we have to do this every day like this you know what doesn't look too cool is me getting out of this fucking thing. <laughs> it's over the top what I felt we could really put people in, so we got with special effects and uh, built these rigs that we could ratchet cars, fly cars through the air into signs, uh, hit walls, hit posts. So they wanted to go bigger than life, but not so big that it looks cartoonish. You have effects, big effects, working every single day. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of rounds going and reloading guns and explosions and bullet hits. When you're asking for things to go out of control, you want things to look violent. You want them out of control. That's the element that makes things a little more difficult. You don't want it contrived looking. You want it to look like it. it's something that would really happen. And when we finally, you know, roll cameras, you, you just cross your fingers and just hope everything just goes the way you expect it to go. What we're going to do here is a lead into what we're calling the war zone. And the uh, dreadnought is going to come down through the alley. It's going to turn, like you see it here, into the gravel. Behind it, special effects is set up a, a, a trench that's got 40 gallons of gasoline in, in it. As he comes through, guns blazing, our heroes, the Mustang and the Ram, are going to come down through this awning here. And when the truck gets to about this point here, we're setting off that 40 gallons, so it'll be a wall of fire that the Mustang and the Ram come blowing through. So, what is about 30, 35,000 pounds? Total, because it's all metal, you know, it's still, it's still, it's still heavy. So when we reversed it, we uh, used another tanker and another tractor, and we added to it the exact same weight as as this one's got. In Gladiator, one of the final scenes in the Colosseum, they bring out tigers, which is a little unexpected. You know something bad's going to happen, but you don't expect wild animals. So we thought we need to have our equivalent of those tigers, and it's just fantastic. The firepower on that thing. The, it's rather like a Spanish galleon in the Armada. It's got this huge flamethrower, these massive guns, a tank turret, and it's just a big old converted uh, Peterbilt truck, like an oil tanker. You have to drive an armor-plated truck at 60 miles an hour and stop it dead. No one had ever done anything like that before. They had no, that's the kind of classic thing where even the stunt guys at one point said, maybe you should do this as a miniature, Paul. And I'm like, no, you know, we've got to do this for real. it like a golfer you know who stands up on the tee he's done it a hundred times but each time is a little different 
I might have done some of these gags, but you know, maybe I've learned something from the last one, maybe I, I improve upon it, maybe I make a change. When you're working with the sizes of the vehicles that we were working with, especially like the, the Dreadnought, those are always a challenge because of the, the sheer size of the vehicles. Each race has something unique. We have fire, cars on fire, a lot of cars being shot at, you know, cars flipping. The important thing is to keep the characters and the actors the audience caring about the character, so all the stunts it's and all the gags are great, but you if you don't care about them, it doesn't matter. This is the kind of movie I want to go see. I mean, it's a very adult uh, uh, form of entertainment, and uh, it, certainly, uh, it certainly plugs itself into what uh, my, my taste is all about. So, um, yeah, this is the kind of movie that would uh, definitely lure me into the, the cinema seat.